Okay, this is a little video tutorial about Newton's form of Kepler's third law. And so, while we spent so much time studying Kepler's laws, it's important to remind yourself just of a few things. And everything I'm sharing here, I have uh, saved some notes on a, on a document that you can print. Uh, but I would encourage you to take some notes as we go along. So when Kepler developed a third law, and he found this 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 harmony, this beautiful relationship between the period of a planet and its uh, semi-major axis or average radius. Um, he simply said that, you know, the greater the period, the, the greater the radius and vice versa. A planet further from the sun has a, a longer period. And then he realized if you measure the period in years, Earth years, you know, that's one sidereal period of Earth's orbit and astronomical units. Similarly, that's for Earth, the, the average distance from the center of Earth and the center of the Sun throughout its orbit is one astronomical unit. Using those units, you could um, write this relationship that the square of the period equals the cube of the radius. Now, uh, Kepler called the radius the semi-major axis. I'm just going to use r, the average orbital radius, and there's a reason for that, which I'll describe later. And if you divide through that this, this proportion, this ratio of r cubed to p squared is 1. And it's very simple if you consider Earth. Uh, uh, one year uh, period is squared is the same as 1 au cubed. 1 cubed over 1 squared is 1 to 1 or 1. Um, but Kepler didn't propose a reason. Remember, this is all an empirical law. And so when, and when Newton followed, Newton realized that the only reason why this is true is because it has something to do with the gravitational force from the sun. And that depends on how much mass the sun has. So when, when Newton came around and he realized that, that mass influences the magnitude of the attractive force of gravity, he simply kind of rearranged this and said, okay, well, that's because the sun has one unit of mass. And we're going to use this, this notation. This is called solar mass units. If you ever see a circle with a dot and an M, that is a solar mass unit. So our sun has, has a mass of one solar mass. Another star that's twice the mass, you would say two solar masses. It's a nice, simple unit. It's kind of like an astronomical unit or a year, right? Uh, one year is Earth's orbital period. One astronomical unit is Earth's orbital radius on average, and uh, one solar mass is the sun's mass. Nice and simple. So if you consider um, some sample problems here, uh, let me just tweak the camera so you can see this a little better. Let's say a planet was orbiting with one, with a period of one year, but it was a twice the distance, two AUs, twice as far from compared to the, the Earth's orbital radius. Well, if you plug that in here, uh, two cubed is eight, one squared is one, so this would be an eight. This would be a, a, a star that has a, a mass of eight solar masses because any planet that's orbiting in, with, at one, uh, with a period of one year would have to be one AU away. So if it's twice as far away and it's moving that fast, well, then the, the, the star that it's orbiting must be much more massive. So you can see we, we, can, we can use this simplified version to explore the masses of stars that have planetary systems that we can observe. If you observe a planet whose period is two years, but it's only one AU from the sun, so the same distance from the sun as Earth, but it's moving like, you know, much slower. Well, then it's a quarter mass of, of, our, of our sun. So now you know the mass of the sun because plug those, those two numbers in. Uh, R is 1. 1 cubed is 1. Divided by 2 squared is 4. So you get 1 fourth. So that star is, has, a, has a mass of 1 quarter of a solar mass. And keep going. Let's say the radius is, is uh, 2, 2 astronomical units, and the period is 2. Well, 2 cubed over 2 squared would be 8 over 4 or 2. So you get 2 solar mass star. Again, you can. I'm just giving you a few examples um, of how you can substitute some simple numbers into this equation to figure out the mass 
at the center of any orbital system. Now this always works when you're when m represents the mass at the center of the orbital system, not the mass of the orbiting body. It's always the mass of the larger object, but you, that you kind of ignore the mass of the orbiting object. So this is sort of an approximation, but it works. Uh, the only problem, of course, is um, as we study orbiting systems, not all masses are large stars at the center of orbiting systems. Sometimes something's orbiting a planet, a moon, something smaller. And so all of Kepler's laws and Newton's refinement of Kepler's uh, third law rely on units for period of years, radius of astronomical units, and solar mass units for mass. But when Newton refined it with the universal law of gravitation, he simply said, okay, that's this right column here. It turns out, if you measure period in seconds, the SI unit and radius of orbit in meters, then you need this little fudge factor here in the middle. Now, I didn't derive it for you here. I can share that derivation at a future time, but you can see the similarities. You're still equating the period of orbit to the radius of orbit. You still have period squared equals r cubed. The difference is you have this constant of proportionality. And this equates four pi squared divided by a g, that's a constant, times the mass. And if m represents the mass in kilograms, that's the SI unit of mass at the center of the orbit, as opposed to solar mass units, we're now using SI units, kilograms of mass. And g, capital G, is the universal gravitation constant from uni Newton's universal law of gravity. Well, then when you substitute these values in and you rearrange this formula to solve for m, because that's what we're going to be doing, finding to solve for the mass in kilograms, then you find that... Um, Instead of saying mass equals r cubed over p squared, you do have mass equals r cubed over p squared, but it's times this constant. So if you multiply 4 times pi squared divided by 6.67 times 10 to the negative 11th, you get 5.92 times 10 to the 11th approximately, the three sig figs. Just kind of rounded that. That is your constant. Make sure you note that. You're going to use that every time today. This constant. And if you want to find the mass, say, of Earth, all you have to do is know the radius of an object orbiting Earth from Earth's center and its period of orbit around Earth. If you want to know the mass of Jupiter, which we're going to do, you just have to know the radius of something orbiting Jupiter and its period of orbit. If you want to know the mass of the Sun, which we're going to look at, substitute the radius of any orbiting object in its period. R represents the average orbital radius or semi-major axis. Uh, P is the sidereal period, the time to do a complete 360 revolution. The trick is using the correct units of seconds and meters. Your activity today, you're going to weigh the mass of the sun, we're going to weigh the mass, we're going to weigh the earth, we're going to weigh Jupiter, all based on determining the radius and period of an orbiting object. You can apply this to any orbital system. That's the beauty of Newton's form of Kepler's third law. It can be applied to figure out the mass at the center of any orbiting system. It's incredible. We use this now to figure out the mass at the center of the Milky Way galaxy, which is a supermassive black hole. We can kind of figure that out. We can use this to figure out the mass um, at the center of these exosystems that have potentially, you know, Earth-like planets orbiting them. And knowing the mass allows us to determine so many other features uh, of these stars and planets and such. Your activity will rely on this formula here, this constant. You're just going to have to figure out the radius and period of orbit in units of seconds and meters as opposed to units of years and astronomical units.